This is page 340 in your notes, chapter 13 in our course, the sixth unit on Excel. We'll be dealing mostly with circular reference and pH calculations in this unit. Let's go to page 342. Recall from your first analytical course the dissociation of a weak acid HA with a molar concentration of CHA we can write the hydrolysis equation. A weak acid, HA, reacts with water to produce some hydronium ion and some conjugate base, A-. Recall the ice tables, initial concentration, then change in concentration, and then equilibrium concentration. I'll deal with the initial and the equilibrium only here. So initially, before the acid has dissociated in water, the concentration is whatever you add. Let's say that's CHA. The concentration of water is a constant. It's 55.5 moles per liter. The concentration of hydronium ion is dependent upon the pH of the water. Assuming the pH is 7, it'll be 10 to the minus 7 moles per liter. And the concentration of the conjugate base, well, there won't be any yet because initially the weak acid hasn't dissociated. But at equilibrium, a certain amount of that acid will have dissociated. We don't know how much, but we'll call it a concentration of x moles per liter. The concentration of water is essentially unchanged because we're dealing with weak acids and dilute solutions, so the difference is negligible. Now the concentration of hydronium ion will be the same as the concentration of the acid that has dissociated, and that will produce an equal concentration of the conjugate base, A-. minus. So we have only one unknown occurring in three locations in this equation. If the Ka value of the acid is known, we can solve for x by solving for the positive root of the resulting quadratic equation. And notice we just want the positive root because concentrations can't be negative. And then if we write the equilibrium expression, Ka is equal to the product of the molar concentrations of the products divided by the molar concentration of the acid remaining at equilibrium we can rearrange this equation, cross multiplying the term CHA minus X gives us this form, which we will solve from soon. But we can go further with this and distribute KA and come up with the standard form of a quadratic equation. Now note carefully, I'm going to use the algebraic form of the quadratic for this calculation. I'll say that a is the coefficient of x squared, and it will always be 1. In all hydrolysis reactions, we consider them one step at a time. So a will always be 1. We needn't concern ourselves with it. b is Ka of the acid, and c is negative Ka times CHA. With a quadratic equation in its standard form set equal to 0, the quadratic formula will give us the roots that is the x-intercepts of the parabola. And the nice thing for us is that value happens to be the value x, which in our case will be hydronium ion concentration, which we're trying to solve for right here. So in Excel, we'll type in a quadratic formula. Here is the formula we will type in, but we'll remind ourselves that this is the form we'll use. a is 1, b is ka, C is negative Ka times CHA. Let's go to the Excel spreadsheet and give that a try. This Excel file is called PH Exercise, and the worksheet is also called PH. Let's solve some hydrolysis equations using the quadratic formula. Here I have periotic acid, iotic acid, and iotic acid again. These are their pKa's. So let's use the quadratic formula to calculate the pH and the hydrogen ion concentration of these acids, periotic and iotic, at these concentrations. So B in the quadratic formula is Ka. And Ka, that'll be equal to 10 raised to the power of negative pKa. Enter. I can autofill that. The constant C is minus Ka times the initial concentration of acid, which is given here. 
that'll be equal to negative Ka times the concentration of the acid. And I can autofill that. The hydrogen ion concentration we'll get from the quadratic formula. That'll be equal to bracket minus Ka, that's minus B, plus the square root of B squared, that's B squared, minus 4 times A is 1, so we can ignore it, times C. Now C is hidden, so that's cell F59. Close two brackets, because we have two open, divided by 2 times A, and A is 1, so ignore it. 0.0378 is the molar hydrogen ion concentration and the pH is the negative log of that hydrogen ion concentration. So we can autofill those. Alright, so 0.1 molar periotic acid has a pH of 1.42. 0.2 molar iotic acid, pH of 0.928. And 0.1 molar iotic acid, 1.151. There's a spot here for you to do it with the sharp calculator, but we've already reviewed the use of the quadratic formula in the sharp calculator, so I'll leave that out at this time. Now what we did for acids, we can also do for bases. This is the hydrolysis equation of a base. Any base reacts with water, it becomes protonated, forming the conjugate acid and producing some hydroxide ion at equilibrium initial concentration of base minus some molar concentration that's dissociated produces an equivalent molar concentration of the conjugate acid and of a hydroxide ion. We can write the Kb expression for this hydrolysis as the product of the molar concentrations of the products divided by the equilibrium concentration of the base. Rearranging gives us x squared equals Kb times Cb minus x which further rearranges to the standard form of the quadratic x squared plus kbx minus kb times cb. So let's go ahead and solve for the pH of some solutions of some bases. Here I have phosphate, carbonate, and ammonia. So we're given the pKbs. The kb is equal to 10 to the power of minus the pKb. Let's drag that down. I'm going to change the format of the numbers to scientific notation to see if it's easier to read. Scientific notation, I think uh, two decimal places should be good enough. That looks better. Okay, so C is minus KB times the concentration of the base equals minus KB times the concentration of the base and we can drag that down as well. I think I'll change those to scientific notation as well. So for the hydroxide ion concentration we'll use the quadratic formula. X is equal to bracket minus B plus the square root of b squared minus 4 times c. c is looks like f87. Close two brackets divided by 2 is 0 0.0923. From the hydroxide ion concentration we get the the pOH is equal to the negative log of the hydroxide ion concentration and the pH is equal to 14 minus the pOH which is right here. And we can drag those three down. We'll look at some more streamlined fashions of doing these calculations next. Let's take a look at page 344 solving problems by successive approximations. Perhaps you remember from your analytical class
the dissociation of an acid in water producing hydronium and conjugate base. Instead of calculating this exactly with the quadratic formula, we can approximate the value of the hydrogen ion concentration. We can do it by the method of successive approximations. So recall the hydrolysis equation for this reaction is Ka is equal to x squared divided by CHA minus x. If we cross multiply this denominator we get this form of the equation. Now we'll just stop here and say alright so if the acid is weak we could say that to a reasonable approximation CHA minus x is approximately equal to CHA, the original concentration. And by doing that, notice how we've simplified our calculation. It's simply CHA times KA is approximately x squared, and that's very easy to solve in Excel. We'll just take the square root of KA times CHA. This is good to a first approximation if the ratio of CHA to KA is greater than 100. Now, I don't know if that means anything to you, and it doesn't mean a lot to me unless I did a lot of these. But let's see how we can handle it nonetheless. So, after we do the first approximation and get a value for the hydrogen ion concentration, why not subtract that from our initial concentration and repeat the process of Ka times CHA and get a second value for the hydrogen ion concentration. It should be closer than the first approximation. And then why not subtract that second approximation of hydrogen ion from the original concentration of acid and do the square root operation again and get a third approximation. And this approximation of the hydrogen ion should be closer than the two previous ones. And just continue the process as many times as necessary until the hydrogen ion concentration steadies out. Now, on a calculator, or on paper, this is tedious, but in Excel, it's really a simple operation. Let's look at that in Excel, and I'll show you how that is done. So here, in the center of the very same worksheet, pH, recall that the pH that we determined for 0.2 molar iodic acid was 0.928 by the quadratic formula. Let's try successive approximations and see what we can do here. So the calculation will be, it'll be equal to SQRT of Ka, which I have in cell Q30. I'll keep an absolute reference to that, times the initial concentration of the acid, where we're assuming that CHA is close to CHA minus X. We'll keep that relative. Close the bracket and press Enter. To a first approximation, we're saying the hydrogen ion concentration is 0.184. What's the pH of that? Equals the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. That's 0.734. Well, that's quite far away from 0.928, but it's only a first approximation. Let's continue the approximation. So what we'll do here, for CHA, we're going to change this. Remember, CHA minus X. So we're going to say equals... 0.2, that's our original concentration, minus whatever we calculated by our first approximation, O32. So now we're saying the concentration is 0.016. Let's drag these formulas down and see what we got. We're seeing that the pH is predicting 1.29, which is quite a bit higher. But let's keep continuing the process of approximations. If I drag this formula down, I'm now saying CHA minus X is approximately equal to 0.2 minus what was previously approximated. Let's drag these formulas down and see how we're doing. 0 0.73, 0 0.1.3, 0 0.8, uh, getting closer. Let's keep the process going. New approximation, we're saying that CHA minus X is approximately 0.2 minus the previous value for hydrogen ion concentration. And let's drag that down. Now we're up to 1.07. You'll notice I'm plotting this as we do it. You can see what's happening is each time we do the approximation, our pH gets closer and closer to the true value and the swinging gets smaller and smaller. Let's try this piece by piece. You can watch what's happening here. Let's just autofill all the way down and see the result. All right, so after about 19 iterations, we reached a pH of 0.927, 
which is pretty close to the exact calculation from the quadratic formula. And notice what's happening with our iterations. Each time we do an iteration, we get smaller and smaller swing, and we eventually we reach a value that's relatively consistent. And now I chose this example knowing that it would take a lot of iterations to stabilize. And the reason is the acid is not that weak an acid, right? Its pKa is 0.77. It's reasonably strong. The assumption that the hydrogen ion concentration dissociated is small and therefore CHA minus X is close to CHA, that's a very poor approximation because it's a strong acid and therefore it took many approximations. With weaker acids, it would take many less approximations. Just slide over to the right a bit and let's try it again, this time with periotic acid. It's a weaker acid than iotic acid, so it should take fewer approximations to reach a constant value. Let's do it again. I'm going to say to a first approximation, the hydrogen ion concentration is the square root of Ka times CHA of Ka times CHA. Now I want absolute reference to my Ka value times CHA. And I want to now use a better approximation of the acid concentration at equilibrium. So I'll say it's equal to the initial value 0.1 minus whatever was calculated here in the previous example. Let's get the pH while we're at it equals the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. Enter 1.32 as to a first approximation. Let's drag down 1.46. Let's just drag this whole thing down a ways and see what we get. So it fairly quickly settled out after only a few approximations to 1.42-ish. So if you look back, you'll see that the pH calculated by the quadratic formula was 1.423. We reached that quite quickly with successive approximations, again because this is a weaker acid, so the initial assumption that CHA minus X was pretty close to CHA. Now we can simplify this successive approximation even further with what's called a circuit of reference. And I want to show you this just because it opens your eyes to some things you can do with Excel. It's rather amazing actually. To do a circuit of reference we're going to actually have Excel calculate using a value in a cell that it hasn't actually calculated yet. But when it calculates it, it'll use it and keep using it in the same cell again and again until no further change occurs. To do circuit of reference, we need to ensure that iterative calculations are selected or enabled. We've done it before. Let's just make sure that you remember how to do this under File, Options, Formulas. In the calculation options, ensure that enable iterative calculations is selected and maximum number of iterations, how many times at most will it try it, or it'll stop when the maximum change between two iterations is less than the value you have in here. The smallest value you can enter, the maximum change here, is 1e minus 15. Let's just put it in so we can see it. Control A, delete say 1 e minus 15. So that's 10 to the minus 15. So the iteration will stop when two successive approximations have a value that differs by less than this. Well that's pretty small. We'll never see that. It'll stop at a thousand iterations before that. But that's how it's used. So make sure that's enabled and say OK. Now let's see what we can do here. In this cell we're going to actually write the exact calculation equals square root of Ka, which we have up here. We don't really need an absolute reference since we're not dragging the formula. Times, open another bracket, CHA, we're using 0.1, I'm going to type it in to make it easier to see, minus, minus what? Minus the concentration of X that it estimates in this calculation. So it's going to actually calculate a value for x in this cell and then use it again in the cell and it'll keep repeating it again and again 
until the change is less than the maximum value or until 1000 iterations has ended. So this will be the cell reference V39. So the very cell we're typing it in. We'll need to close two brackets and that looks like it might work. Enter and we get a value of 0378 and the pH for that is equal to the negative log of that hydrogen ion concentration and that is 1.4230 right on the money. So we did that so quickly that we didn't even see it. If it had taken many iterations perhaps you'd seen it chugging away for 30 seconds or so. Alright, let's try a circular reference one more time here. We have iodic acid at 0.2 molar concentration and now I've written the pH we obtained from the calculator here, 0.928, and let's see how we do. We use the formula, the exact formula equals the square root of Ka times CHA minus X. That'll be equal to the square root. Here's Ka for iodic acid. We don't need an absolute reference because we're not dragging it. Times bracket CHA this one was 0.2 molar, I'll just type it in, 0.2 minus itself, minus the value in that cell, which is V45. We'll need to close two brackets and see how we do. 0.118 and 0.928 piece, that worked great. Now what happens here if we go to iodic acid again, same Ka value, but now we go to a lower concentration strong acid, low concentration, that's a bad situation for an approximation. Let's try it. This will be equal to the square root of Ka, which is here, times bracket. The initial concentration in this case is 0.1 minus whatever it solves in the cell, which is going to be V46 close two brackets, enter, and we get a problem. We don't get a solution here. And what's the reason for that? Well, we are taking the square root of a number, and at some point in the approximations it appears that a negative number has been generated, and so it gets stuck because we can't take the square root of a negative number. So what can we do about that? What if we wrote the function this way. Let's take the square root of the absolute value of Ka times CHA minus X and that'll make sure that we get a positive value to take the square root of. Let's give it a try. So equals square root of the absolute value of Ka times bracket CHA, in this case it's 0.1 molar minus the value that it will calculate in cell V46. We'll need to close three brackets now since we have three open. We get a value, but it's not the same value we obtained from the quadratic formula or with your calculator. The correct value is 1.151 and this stopped at 1.012. So that's, well it's close, but can we do better? Let's go back to our Enable Iterative Calculations selection and see what we can do there. We'll go to File, Options, Formulas. So we have the maximum change as 1e minus 15. We can't make it any smaller than that. But let's try adding another power of 10. Let's try uh, 10,000 iterations and see what we get. All right, so the number has changed. It's now 0.944 pH. So it looks like we're actually worse off. Okay, let's add some more iterations and see if we can fix it. File options, formulas. Let's try adding another power of 10. And it says, nope, the maximum number of iterations is 32,767. Well, let's try that. 32,767. And say, okay. 1.9 instead of 1.15. It's getting even worse. So what's the message here? Well, sometimes approximations don't work very well. This is like the worst case scenario for approximations.
we have a small pKa, which means it's a strong acid at a low concentration, and so the approximation is very poor. So in such cases, you can always go back and use the quadratic formula. I just wanted to introduce you to the power of circular reference and, of course, its limitations as well. There are other examples on this worksheet where you can practice the use of successive approximations and circular references. If you scroll down to the bottom of the worksheet, you'll see examples for calculating the pH of various bases in water. Page 347, pH at the endpoint of an acid-base titration. This material is relatively straightforward, but it's something I believe every student should be very familiar with. The endpoint of an acid-base titration is commonly detected with the aid of an acid-base indicator whose color change occurs as close as possible to the pH at the equivalence point of the titration. Now the CRC handbook and many other sources have extensive listings of acid and base indicators and the color changes at various pHs, like the chart you see here. Here's the pH range and here are a variety of indicators that change color at various pHs. So in order to determine which indicator to choose, you must know the pH at the endpoint of the titration. Let's start with a familiar example. Say we're titrating 0.1 molar acetic acid. It's a moderately strong acid with 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide. It's a strong base. The neutralization will be acetic acid plus sodium hydroxide producing water and sodium acetate. Let's look at an image of this reaction. So say we have 25 mils of 0.1 molar acetic acid in an Erlenmeyer flask and we're going to titrate it with 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide from the burette. You appreciate that it will take 25 mils of sodium hydroxide an equal volume as the acetic acid because they're the same concentration. Now neglecting any other water that was added such as rinsing, the total volume would be 25 plus 25 or 50 mils. In other words, the total volume is double the initial volume of the acetic acid solution. Now we know that one mole of acetic acid would produce one mole of sodium acetate. Now if we were adding solid sodium hydroxide instead of liquid, then the volume wouldn't change. 25 mils of 0.1 molar acetic acid would produce 25 mils of 0.1 molar sodium acetate. But because we're doubling the volume, the concentration is cut in half. So instead of having 0.1 molar sodium acetate, we have 0.5 molar sodium acetate at the endpoint. Yeah, follow? So at the endpoint of this titration, how much acetic acid is left and how much sodium hydroxide is left? And the answer is none. A strong base like sodium hydroxide will drive this reaction to completion. And assuming that we add a stoichiometric quantity of the two, there will be no sodium hydroxide left and there will be no acetic acid left. You only have water and sodium acetate present. Now sodium acetate is a weak base so in water it will hydrolyze slightly. It will be protonated to a small extent producing a little bit of acetic acid and a little bit of hydroxide ion. Sodium ion doesn't hydrolyze. So these two species acetic acid and hydroxide are not here because we didn't titrate all the acid or we added too much base. They're present because only sodium acetate was left and sodium acetate hydrolyzes to a small extent. So at the end point of the titration the pH is not neutral. It's going to be slightly basic because there's some hydroxide remaining. So let's do the calculation. Acetic acid is a Ka of 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5 its pK is the negative log of that value, which is 4.74. And so the pKb of the conjugate base of acetic acid is 14 minus its pKa. Or 14 minus 4.74 is 9.26. And that Kb then is 10 to the negative pKb, or 5.53 times 10 to the minus 10. Sodium acetate is a weak base. 
it will only hydrolyze to a small extent. But when it does, it produces acetic acid and a little bit of hydroxide. Let's calculate the concentration of hydroxide at the end point of the titration. To do that, all we need is the Kb value and its concentration, and we have those. Here's the hydrolysis expression for acetate ion. It's equal to the product of the molar concentration of the products divided by the concentration of the reactant at equilibrium. So let's put some values in here. Uh, X is the concentration of acetic acid formed and the same concentration of hydroxide is formed. And the concentration of base remaining is the initial concentration that we started with minus the small amount that dissociates. Rearranging this, cross multiplying, we have X squared is Kb times the equilibrium concentration of the base, Cb minus X. Since acetate is a weak base, the amount of it that dissociates would be very small. So we can say to a first approximation that X is essentially zero or negligible, and we can get a good approximation on X or the hydroxide ion using just the square root of Kb times Cb initially present. And so our first approximation would be the root of 5.53 times 10 to the minus 10 times the concentration of the base originally present, 0 0.05, is 5.3 times 10 to the minus 6. That's our hydroxide ion concentration at equivalence point. The pOH will be the negative log of this value, and that's 5.3. And therefore, the pH is 14 minus the pOH, or 8.72. So that is the pH at the end point of the titration. So which indicator should we choose to indicate equivalence point? So go to our table and find 8.72 is around here. So we could use thymol blue, it should be green about here. More commonly, phenolphthalein is used. It goes from colorless to pink at about that pH. So that's the way the pH at the end point of a titration is calculated. So this is the Excel file named pH exercise. The worksheet is endpoint pH. I have an exercise here for you to calculate the pH at the endpoint of a titration of these acids with sodium hydroxide. And let's assume we're using 0.1 molar acids. We're titrating with 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide. And I worked out the first one here for you just as we did previously for acetic acid. Let's do another one. Let's do hydrofluoric acid. It's monoprotic. One equivalent of base will neutralize one equivalent of acid. I'm giving you the pKa, 3.45, and here is the conjugate base that's present at the endpoint of the titration. Because it's a base, it will hydrolyze slightly, producing some hydroxide, making the pH basic. But how basic? What's the pH? What indicator would we use? So let's get the pKb. It'll equal to 14 minus the pKa of 3.45. That's 10.55. So Kb is equal to 10 raised to the power of negative pKb. And the concentration of fluoride present will be half the initial concentration. Initially, it's 0.1, so the concentration is 0.05 at equivalence point. And so the hydroxide ion concentration will be equal to the square root of Kb times Cb minus x. And since we know how to do circular references, we don't need to approximate. We can use the exact equation here. This will be equal to sqrt of Kb times bracket concentration of the base, which is 0 0.05. It's hiding under H6, but I'll just type it in, 0 0.05 minus whatever it calculates in this cell, which is cell I6. Close two brackets, and that's 1.2 times 10 to the minus 6. What's the pOH of that? Equals the negative log of that hydroxide ion concentration. 5.93 and the pH is equal to 14 minus the pOH 8.07. So the question is what indicator would we use?
So at a pH of 8.1, mm, probably phenolphthalein again would be close. Thymol blue might work. If you don't see an appropriate indicator in this list, you can check the CRC handbook. It's a much more exhaustive list of indicators. All right, so you can do the rest of these. Now, there's something here we need to explain first, though. For monoprotic acids, like the first few, the process is done the same way in each case. But when we get to a diprotic acid like hydrogen sulfide, or sulfuric acid, or sulfurous acid, or a triprotic acid like phosphoric acid, there's something else we need to consider. Let's scroll down on this worksheet a bit. I have an illustration I'd like to show you. So let's say we're titrating 25 mils of the diprotic acid, sulfuric acid, 0.1 molar. We're titrating with 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide. How many mils of 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide will be required to neutralize 25 mils of the diprotic acid, sulfuric acid? It would take 50 mils, twice as much. So what's the final volume at the end point of the titration? The final volume would be 25 plus 50, again neglecting any rinse water that we might have added during the titration. We're up to 75 mils. If we had added solid sodium hydroxide, then 25 mils would have stayed 25 mils. And the concentration of sulfate that began with 0.1 molar sulfate would be 0.1 molar sulfate at the end. But since the volume is going to triple, then the final volume of sulfate would be one-third of the initial volume. That would be 0.033 instead of 0.1 molar. Take a look at this example here. Now this is sulfurous acid instead of sulfuric, but the concept is the same. If we titrate sulfurous acid, it's a moderately strong acid. Its pKa is 1.8. We add one equivalent of NaOH. Then sulfurous acid is half neutralized, forming sodium bisulfite. Then we add another equivalent of sodium hydroxide, or another 25 mils in our example, to convert bisulfite all the way to sulfite. So we want to calculate the pH at the endpoint of the titration. We need to know the pKb of the species that's actually present at the endpoint of the titration. That would be sulfite ion. The pKb of bisulfite will not help us. We need the pKb of sulfite, the final product. So let's go back up to the table. So here is sulfurous acid. And what I'm giving you is the pKa not of sulfurous acid. I'm giving you the pKa of bisulfite, which is the conjugate acid of sulfite, which is what's present at the endpoint. So here, pKb equals 14 minus the pKa of its conjugate acid bisulfite. Kb is equal to 10 raised to the power of the negative pKb. And what's the concentration of sulfite that will be present? Because it was a diprotic acid we started with, we will have triple the initial volume. The final concentration is a third of the initial concentration. So not 0.1, but 0 0.0333. The hydroxide ion concentration is equal to the square root of Kb times concentration of the base, which is in this cell that's hiding, H12, that's 0 0.0333, minus whatever it calculates in cell I12. Close two brackets. 5.14 times 10 to the minus 5. The pH is equal to the negative log of the hydroxide ion concentration. And the pH will be equal to 14 minus the pOH, which is 9.7. So what indicator should we use for this titration? pH of 9.7. We're looking at something like thymolphthalein. Be a good indicator, colorless to blue at that pH. Hydrogen sulfide is diprotic. I've given you the pKa of hydrosulfide.
which is the conjugate acid of sulfide that will be present at the endpoint of the titration. This would be calculated the same way as sulfurous acid is. Likewise for sulfuric acid. What about phosphoric acid? It's triprotic. Let's take a look at this for a moment. Phosphoric acid is triprotic. Adding one equivalent of sodium hydroxide produces dihydrogen phosphate. Adding a second equivalent produces monohydrogen phosphate. And finally, adding a third equivalent produces phosphate. Now, in reality, it will be difficult, if not impossible, to titrate phosphoric acid all the way to phosphate using 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide. It's just not strong enough. But, but perhaps if we use a higher concentration, we might be able to. But for the sake of this calculation, let's just assume that the 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide is strong enough to completely neutralize phosphoric acid all the way to phosphate. I'm asking you to calculate the pH at the endpoint of the titration and what indicator would be appropriate. So if we started with 25 mils of 0.1 molar phosphoric acid, what would be the final volume at the endpoint of the titration? We would add how much sodium hydroxide? 25, 50, 75. 75 mils plus the original 25, the final volume would be a 100 mils. So our 25 mils a solution that we began with became 100 mils, so the dilution factor is a factor of 4. So if the concentration of phosphoric acid starts at 0.1 molar, what would be the concentration of phosphate at the endpoint of the titration? It would be a quarter of the concentration of phosphate that started. This 1 mole of phosphoric acid contains 1 mole of phosphate. It produces 1 mole of phosphate, but in 4 times the volume. So the concentration is decreased by a factor of 4. It'll be 0 0.025 molar. So here you're going to use 0 0.025 molar as the concentration. And what I've given you here for pKa is not the pKa of phosphoric acid. That's a moderately strong acid. Its pKa is 1.7. What I've given you here is the pKa of the conjugate acid of phosphate monohydrogen phosphate, which is a very weak acid with a pKa of 12.3. Let's do this one together. The pKb of phosphate is equal to 14 minus the pKa of its conjugate acid, monohydrogen phosphate. The Kb is equal to 10 raised to the negative pKb. The hydroxide ion concentration is equal to the square root of Kb times concentration of the base would be 0 0.025 in this case minus whatever is calculated in cell I13. Close two brackets. 1.45 times 10 to the minus 2. So the pOH is equal to the negative log of the hydroxide ion concentration, 1.84, and therefore the pH would be equal to 14 minus the pOH, and that's 12.16. That's a really high pH. Do we have an indicator that would change color around that? Well, perhaps alizarin in yellow. Maybe you'd need to find something higher if, in fact, this could be carried out. Theoretically, that is the pH at the endpoint of the titration. Let's go back to the notes for a moment. Page 348. Calculate the pH of equivalence point when 0.1 molar ammonia solution is titrated with 0.1 molar HCl. We know that HCl is a strong acid. Ammonia is a moderately strong base. Its pKb is 4.74. This reaction will go to completion. If we add stoichiometric quantities of ammonia and HCl, there will be no ammonia left and no HCl left. But what does remain? Well, you're going to produce ammonium chloride. At 25 mils of 0.1 molar ammonia plus 25 mils of 0.1 molar HCl produces 50 mils of 0 0.05 molar ammonium chloride. Now chloride doesn't hydrolyze, but ammonium ion does. In fact, it's a weak acid. So the ammonium ion releases a proton to the water, 
producing some hydronium ion and producing some ammonia. And these are present because we've completely removed ammonia and HCl. So we can see that at the end point of the titration, the pH will be somewhat acidic. Let's calculate the pH and pick the appropriate indicator for the titration. Ammonia is a moderately strong base. Its pKb is 4.74. So the pKa of its conjugate acid, ammonium ion, is equal to 14 minus the pKb, which is 9.3. And the Ka is 10 to the minus 9.26, or 5.5 .5 times 10 to the minus 10. So it's a pretty weak acid. Here's the hydrolysis equation. The product of the molar concentration of the products, ammonia and hydronium ion, divided by the molar concentration of the reagent at equilibrium. This will be NH4 plus minus X. We'll just neglect the X. It's 5.5 .5 times 10 to the minus 10 is the Ka value. Rearranging, we get the hydronium ion to a first approximation is equal to the root of Ka times CHA, the initial concentration of ammonium ion. And that comes out to be 5.2 times 10 to the minus 6 corresponding to a pH of 5.3. So indeed, it's slightly acidic. So we need to choose an indicator that changes around pH 5.3. Let's take a look at our table of indicators. So at pH 5.3, we're looking at, ooh, we don't really have an appropriate indicator here, right? Chlorophenol red, perhaps that would work. It would start to see the first tinge of, of red at 5.3. That might work. Methyl red, which is not shown on this table, is the indicator commonly used for titrating ammonia with HCl or any acid because it changes from yellow to red at about pH 5.3. Let's go back to the Excel file and there's an exercise for you to perform there. We're still on the endpoint pH worksheet. Here are a variety of bases. Let's assume that each one is 0.1 molar and you're titrating with 0.1 molar HCl. Calculate the pH at the end point of the titration and identify a suitable pH indicator for the titration. And we've done ammonia already. I want you to look at the next one here, sodium carbonate. Now, sodium carbonate is a dibasic base. It'll require two equivalents of HCl to titrate it. Please take a look at this illustration. Here's sodium carbonate. Let's assume it's 25 mils of 0.1 molar. It would require 25 mils of 0.1 molar HCl to bring it to its half neutralized state, sodium bicarbonate. Another 25 mils would be required of the acid to bring it all the way to carbonic acid. So 25 mils of sodium carbonate plus 50 mils of HCl. The final volume is 75 mils. So the concentration of carbonic acid is actually one-third of the concentration of sodium carbonate you started with. Again, assuming that both solutions are of the same molarity. So let's do the calculation for sodium carbonate together. So I'm giving you the pKb not of sodium carbonate, but I'm giving you the pKb of the conjugate base of carbonic acid, which is sodium bicarbonate, and that's 7.66. So the pKa is equal to 14 minus the pKb of the conjugate base, 6.34. All right, the Ka is equal to 10 raised to the power of minus pKa. The concentration of the carbonic acid formed would be 0.1 divided by 3 is 0 0.0333 molar. The hydrogen ion concentration will be equal to the square root of Ka times CHA, which was 0 0.033, that's hiding, I'll just type it in, 0 0.0333, minus whatever is calculated in this cell, I20. Close two brackets, 1.2 times 10 to the minus 4, and the pH is equal to the negative log of that hydrogen ion concentration, which is 3.9 or 4. So if you're going to titrate sodium carbonate, 
with HCl, the pH at the end point of the titration is 3.9 or about 4, so what indicator should you use? From our list, we can see that bromocresyl green is a good choice. It changes from blue to green at the end point of the titration. Methyl orange can also be used. It changes from yellow to red at the end point of the titration. There's one example here that will not calculate correctly, and this is urea. Urea is a really weak base. Even to just titrate one of these weakly basic amine groups, notice how weak it is, 13.2 pKb. You'd protonate just one of these, but then the strength of the conjugate acid would be what? Equals 14 minus pKa, so that's 0.79. That's such a strong acid that the method of approximation will fail when you try it. Let's see what happens here. Equals 10 raised to the power of the negative pKa. The concentration would be half the initial concentration because we're only going to titrate one of the amino groups. That's 0.05. And now if we calculate the hydrogen ion concentration, we have a problem equals the square root of Ka times CHA, which is 0 0.05 minus whatever it calculates in cell I25. Close two brackets, enter, and it can't calculate it. And that's because one of the approximations requires the square root of a negative number and there's just no way around this so in such a case as this you simply would use the quadratic formula. Now that's probably enough for the calculation of pH at the end point of a titration. I do feel it's really important that you are well familiar with this even though it's not all that complicated.